and including this gentleman right here, who uh, we're very excited to have with us. He is in town from the great city of Detroit. And if you're familiar with the work of Marvin Gaye, Stevie Wonder, Gladys Knight, um, Diana Ross, yes. um, and any number of other artists on Motown, then you're familiar with his work. Temptations, yeah. Temptations and, and many others. Uh, so won't you please join me in welcoming Mr. Paul Reiser. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I, I did mention a bunch of people that you know, Paul has done arrangements for over the years, but uh, a lot of times I like to start these things off with just a little bit of music so it gets everybody on the same page, just in case folks may not be familiar with any of those artists or records. So here's one thing from Paul's catalog, and we'll we actually revisit this in a little while. Yeah, thank you. Now, of course, everybody, uh, no, we have uh, made history in the United States with uh, President Obama being elected. That was his theme song. He, in fact, he says that, uh, oh, this is President Obama speaking now. He says that uh, he and his wife often dated, and all they played was Stevie Wonder. Back when they had their first kids, it was because of Stevie Wonder. <laughs> okay? And he, he, uh, he pronounces this all the time, you know. So that was his theme song in his campaign for the two years prior to uh, 2008. Mm -hmm. That was his theme song, Science Hill Delivered. And he did, see? <laughs> now, uh, can you tell everybody in the room, you know, what, what part of that record was your responsibility? What, what did you have to do? What were you doing? I all did that? the, from the ground up, I do rhythm also, but I enjoy doing the sweetening on top, which they call the strings and horns. But I did the rhythm on this one, horns. Strings. Uh, well, well, the strings are coming later. <laughs> They're not on the original. This, this is one of my fantasies, just to put strings on it, and and I'm doing that just today, just for kicks, you know, to show you how what my technique technique is, how I do. Right. So, so you did the arranging on this recording and many yes. other recordings for Motown, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. So, what what does that entail? What, what okay, that? a producer will will come to me with a song which the producer at this time was Clarence Paulo, who is no longer with us, he's passed on. He was Stevie's confidant and friend during his early formative days from maybe uh, 10 years old, maybe nine years old on up through um, the time that he passed away, uh, which Stevie was in his 30s at the time, see? So um, that was Clarence Paulo. He was the producer, Hank Cosby also was producer on this product. Uh, Stevie wrote the song, of course. Stevie was not producing at that time. Okay, he was very young. I mean, extremely young, maybe 15, 16 years old at the time. So, uh, I got the song from the producers, and uh, they said, "Well, can you do this?" And uh, I took the demo tape and did it. And uh, one thing I found out too is that it should have held on to all of those demo tapes, a little bit we know where they were going to end up in history, you know, in time. But anyhow, uh, uh, they brought me the tape. Uh, well, at that time, yes, it was a tape. They didn't even have, uh, they didn't have cassette tapes at that time when we did this, okay? They, they had like reel-to-reel, -reel, what they call five-inch, seven-inch, seven-and-a-half. And, and uh, that's what I was given. And I did the uh, arrangement, uh, and then we went in and cut the rhythm initially. Then we uh, overdubbed the, uh, the horns, uh, like maybe a day or two from the time we did the rhythm. Okay. Well, we had a, a constant turnover process, like a factory almost, like an assembly line. Yeah. Constant turnover of music. We didn't get much time to rest in between. Mm -hmm. See, mm -hmm. it's called hot off the press. See? So what kind of shape was the song in when you got the reel to reel from the producers? The oh, writers? well, it was Stevie playing piano, so it was good. That's all I got. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's, he's thorough in his song. Every chord he plays, he means it. Every voice in, basically, he means it. Okay, mm -hmm. it's not by chance that he plays something. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. So it's very good, good demos. Okay, so I guess let's back up a little bit and get you know, to how you got involved with Motown. Um, mm -hmm. you know, what, what, how did it start for you, your interest in music and living in Detroit, growing up in Detroit? Well, to begin with, I hated uh, R&B music with a passion from the time I started music, which was seven years old. And um, 
I had a, a, a conductor at that time in elementary school, a director, music director, named Harold Arnaldi, who since, on, since passed on in that time. So he took me under his wing at seven years old. I played trombone. It was several years before I could reach the last position. Everybody knows trombone, seven positions. <laughs> I reached six for a long time. And then my arm got long enough to reach seven, see, way out here. See, It was bigger than I was for a long time, see, the trombone. But uh, uh, I picked that instrument. But then I, I gained a love for like trumpet and, and cello. Cello is probably my favorite instrument. But uh, getting back a little bit, uh, uh, when you take music, you never know where it's going to end up when you start. You just have to practice. And then when you're tired of practicing, you practice some more, right? <laughs> take private lessons. And then you, um, you, before you know it, you don't know when the transition is made, but you can play. All of a sudden, you know music. I can't figure out the day when I actually started playing. See, I don't know when. It just happened. So you just practice, 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 and all of, all of a sudden you're into the transition of, well, this is music you're making, you see? And instead of just noise, all your friends say, cut out that noise. They holler up in your room upstairs where you practice toot, 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 toot. <laughs> and they say, cut the noise out. But then now they all uh, uh, understand where I was going with it. See, I do too. So uh, then I went from uh, elementary school to uh, junior high school where I basically learned how to, uh, how to put music to paper, notes to paper, by uh, transcribing jazz. I was jazz and classical, nothing but jazz and classical, that's all, see. So I was transcribing jazz uh, songs for my friends, a lot of little combos we played in. I was a trombone, and, and uh, of course we had like bass drums, bass drums keyboard, and, uh, and uh, a couple of sax players, and that was our little unit in high school. We moved around and played college campuses and did little jobs like that. But I started uh, transcribing uh, probably when I was maybe 13, 12, 13 years old. Then I'd take it to my rehearsals with my guys and i say, oh, this is how they make the sounds. Because for some reason I had a great ear from way back, you know. I was able to, to hear it and put it on paper. And, uh, uh, but then I found out about voicings, okay, when I was able to transcribe. So uh, then I went to Cass Tech High School in Detroit, which is pretty well known throughout the world. Uh, we had a band that was capable of, uh, of, of uh, playing at the college level at the time. We, we were high school. We are the only high school band submitted into uh, uh, the, uh, admitted, I should say, at Smithsonian institutions in Washington, D.C. We're the only high school band where they archive all kinds of music and art and different things. Everybody, who's heard of Smithsonian institutions in here? Okay, good. Well, there's a very unique club, I should say, you know? And uh, we're the only high school band. I happened to be first trombone player, and never knew where I would end up when I started, mm -hmm. but I was first chair trombone in the band. And uh, from that point, I, um, uh, upon graduate, well, prior to graduation, maybe six months, I got a call from uh, a friend of mine who preceded me out of Cass State high school into Motown. He was a viola player, Dale Warren. He called and said they needed a trombone player to fill a spot, okay? So reluctantly, I went and played. And uh, uh, boy, was I shocked to see how much effort it took to make music, R&B music. Mm -hmm. A lot of effort, okay? Did, mm -hmm. at, at the time, like, what did you know about Motown? You were in high school. Um, you said Probably you zero. You ignored R&B at that point Probably still. zero. Yeah, absolutely zero, you know. Uh, I knew probably more about Atlantic Records, uh, Ruth Brown and the likes, uh, mm -hmm. just from listening to my my, my siblings uh, play records and whatnot. Mm -hmm. That's the way I, that's the only way I put my ear to it because they played it. Mm -hmm. But uh, Motown, I learned when I went to Motown, see? Didn't know what I was learning, but I learned. That was my, that was my uh, college for my career, literally, uh, yeah. That's so it. what was your first impression when you walked in? What was it like? What was the session like? Well, what did they tell you to do? Well, How many people were there? I played a Mr. Funk Brothers. Who heard of the Funk Brothers in here? A dangerous group of, group of men, the Funk Brothers, okay? <laughs> and here I come with a lot of discipline out of Cass Tech, we were truly disciplined high school. And the Funk Brothers are like drunkards. They like fights. They like, but that's how they made the good music, see? 
they were natural, they were drunk when they made a lot of the music, they were high off of drugs when they made a lot of the music, they, but they were a group, uh, like a brotherhood, the Funk Brothers. So I sat amongst them, I sat next to the great George Bohannon on trombone, anybody knows jazz would, would probably know of George Bohannon, trombone, great trombone player. But I still took it all for granted because I'm classical. I'm, I'm what they call long hair, even though I had short hair. <laughs> okay, I was, I was considered long hair, you know, and kind of better than they were, you know, because I'm, I'm out of the classical genre. And boy, did I ever learn quick, because it takes so much discipline and so much stamina to sit there and take, say, take 15, take 20, take 30, you know, of a song, and you got so much uh, strength in your chops, you know? So, not that I respected the music so much, but I respected what it took to get to the music, the end product, see, mm -hmm. at that point, yeah. And how did, the, uh, had, how did the other players take to you? How did they take uh, to you? Yeah, I'm thinking back. Uh, it wasn't, wasn't easy, because uh, it was like um, mixing apples and oranges, you know. I was, a, I was an orange amongst many apples, okay? And uh, it was very difficult at first because, first of all, I didn't know, I had no street smarts. You know, all these fellows were street smart. Everybody was absolutely street smart. And uh, I come out of a very religious background, uh, very strict upbringing in religion. And so I'm sitting amongst these, uh, these gang members, these gun toters, these drunkards <laughs> that made great music. Okay, simple as that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, they didn't take to me very well uh, initially, especially when I went to, uh, to conducting and, and, uh, and, and uh, writing for sessions, writing music and orchestrating and whatnot. Not a lot of uh, respect uh, did I get, you know, because they weren't disciplined. I was, see. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, how, long did, how long were you just playing trombone in the band until oh, you got that to lasted, other things? Oh, that lasted... Playing trombone lasted about um, probably a year, year and a half. Mm -hmm. And I found out there was something better. I started copying scores of uh, ranges around there, just the uh, likes of uh, uh, Ernie Wilkins, uh, Slide Hampton, uh, Maurice King, uh, just, uh, just numerous arrangers accomplished. Johnny Allen was another one accomplished, well-educated arrangers. So, uh, arrangers and orchestrators. So I'm here I am, I'm, I'm a copyist. That's how I started, so I noticed their techniques. And when you, when you develop your own technique, it's a, it's a mix of many things, you know. Then you come down and finally whittle it down to your own technique. Mm -hmm. So, um, then I started, uh, uh, I found out there was a, a way to make more money by doing less work, which was, I think, <laughs> That, that was by not, uh, 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 by not playing trombone, which was a trombone is a tough instrument. Tough, see, very tough. Uh, like um, most instruments are, you have to be really dedicated to, to, to master them, all of them. Mm -hmm. But trombone in particular, very difficult instrument, see. And uh, uh, what happened is that uh, I found my, my joy in, in uh, copying scores, and then I graduated into my own orchestration of certain uh, pieces. Producers would come to me and ask me to orchestrate. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. You say you made a little bit more money doing the, the scores and the arranging. Yes. What, were the, what yes. were the rates for the musicians like back oh, then? Oh, scary. <laughs> <laughs> we started out at 250 per song, now mind you. No time limit. Uh, it's $2.50, right? $2.50 right? right. American, okay? All right. But what happens is we enjoy what we're doing. It was a love of labor, you know, and a labor of love, <laughs> you know, you name it. We just enjoyed making music. That's why it comes out the way it came out. See, when, when there's money at the forefront, music is not really the, the primary interest, see, and therefore the creativity lacks. The, the, the total creativity lacks, I'll put it that way. A person, if they know they're not going to be paid what they should be paid and what they're requesting, they're not going to put forth their whole effort. Well, that's the human nature side of it, mm -hmm. see. Not that it's wrong, but that's just human nature. Right. So it was 250 and I like it, oh, for how long would the song take? Yeah. How long would the oh, song take? Oh, the song would take uh, till however long it took to get it. 
take 20, take 50, take 40, you know, however long, literally. Um, but normally we would average maybe eight, 10 takes, uh, and then we're on to the next song, see. And usually the, the, the first take was the better of the 10, <laughs> okay? That's usually the way it happens. When you go back and really listen, the feeling was always there the first time, see. But then, uh, okay, getting back to the money, we got to raise to $5 per song, $5 American, okay? Then we got to raise to $7.50 per song, still no time limit. If we weren't union, in other words, no unions, okay? None. Uh, then we got to raise to $15 per song, okay? But we were cutting so many songs, but we left with a pocket full of money, okay? I mean, we'd turn, them, turn over, turn over maybe 20, 30 songs a week, and you add that up, that's a pretty good piece of money. A lot of work, but uh, uh, we, had, we made money doing what we enjoyed doing. Mm -hmm. So then uh, Motown went to uh, the Federation, the American Federation of Musicians, the National, and tried to become a signatory. Who know, everybody knows what a signatory is, or they wanted to be li listed as a record label at the union level, okay, where they get uh, all the profits from the union, the union wouldn't be coming in, shutting down their company at some point, okay? So they become a signatory. The union turned them down, see? Little did they know Motown was gonna become a huge success, see? So when uh, they wanted to, when the union wanted Motown to join, Motown kind of gave them a hard time, see, because they didn't need them, they were successful. But eventually they became a signatory, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you started doing the arranging. Well, how, did you, yes. how did you get to be doing the thing that you became known to be doing? Well, I started uh, very simply, I started arranging um, rhythm section, uh, song, songs for rhythm section, mm -hmm. uh, which is, a, you know, of course you got guitar, drums, bass, piano, and a uh, couple of pianos we used, uh, four, three guitars, we used uh, two drum sets at, on occasion at the same time. We used percussionists, okay? That's melodic percussion and uh, the shakers and all that, see? Vibes, uh, bells, orchestra bells, real percussionists, see, from, from Detroit Symphony, by the way. Um, then, um, uh, as, as, I, as I gained uh, my confidence and they gained confidence in me, I'm talking about the producers, they gave me more and more uh, intricate uh, assignments. Mm -hmm. And eventually I went to doing strings, which I really enjoy, okay? Mm -hmm. Strings and, and, well, the, the strings I enjoy more because they're more disciplined, of course. <laughs> Being classical, they're more disciplined. Mm -hmm. Horn players are middle level discipline. Rhythm players are no discipline. <laughs> So I chose to, uh, to do the top, the strings, uh, because I made more money. The time was less spent. I enjoyed writing everything. They played everything I wrote on the paper, corrected things, mm -hmm. and uh, the, you know, made more money with less effort, and I enjoyed it more. Mm -hmm. so, so to be yeah. a separate arranger for a song to do rhythm a lot of times, if, yeah. if you were doing only strings, there would be somebody else doing the other things? Sometimes. Or sometimes. Like, uh, primarily, yes, uh, most of the time in my mid-career and on mm -hmm. further, okay? okay? Yeah. Well, why don't we play something from, okay. uh, from this CD of, of stuff that Paul has done? And I think we're all going to know a bunch of these songs. <laughs> No, thank you, thank you, thank you. I know we have, how many rhythm players do we have, in, like, like bass, drums, guitar, and all that bottom, okay? I want to mention something about the Funk Brothers here, okay? I know you listen to that intently, right? If you notice, the bass anchors one. Boom, boom, two and four, boom, boom, It's always anchored, if you notice, notice that, see? That's the thing that they brought to all the songs that they played on. They anchored the rhythm, see? And everything else was easy to, well, not easy, but easier to put on top, mm -hmm. see? Mm -hmm. This track in particular has, you know, this is probably one of the most famous Motown, you know, classics of all time. And um, the arrangement, not just the string arrangement, but the arrangement of the whole thing is very, very um, distinctive. 
Now I have to say this to give qualifications where it's due. Mm -hmm. um, Smokey pretty much comes into a studio. He he Smokey did the Robinson. rhythm. Smokey yeah. Robinson. So he pretty much arranged the rhythm as far as structure and everything, but the Funk Brothers naturally put the feeling into it. Robert White is, plays that distinctive guitar line. Doom, 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 right? Very distinct. He developed that line. Uh, Willie Shorter, a very good arranger friend of mine, did the horns, okay? Uh, and now I came in and put a little icing on top with the strings, okay? Mm -hmm. Now so that's that's how the, it was layered. That's how we did a lot of things in Motown. You uh, you mentioned before we played the song that the Temptations didn't like the song. Oh no! Then. So what was? Why didn't they like? Well, the song? Well, they thought it was a square song. <laughs> it was a square. Yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> uh, the reason so they they them being street people, Smokey being uh, not too hip a guy. Okay, not funky. Smokey wasn't funky at all. <laughs> if you listen to all of his songs. <laughs> Not one of them is funky, okay? <laughs> Not one of them. But he's a great writer and producer. Yeah, he found his niche and he, he milked it, see, mm -hmm. you know? Now, um, uh, uh, now Smoke, uh, well, well, yes, uh, when, when the Temptations heard it, without the they, without the strings, they said, uh, we don't like this song. In fact, to this day, Otis Williams, the only living original Temptation, he tells the same story that I'm telling, okay? He says that until he heard those strings, they didn't like the song. In fact, they went in and redid some vocals after they heard the strings, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's how, that's how it came about. They hated the song, literally, okay? Biggest hit they ever had. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but the strings mm -hmm. take it to a whole different place, too. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's one of, the, that bridge is one of the more, maybe the second most famous part of the song after the intro. Um, you know, what, what goes through your mind when you're doing something like that? <laughs> Who knows? You just do what you feel and let it go and nobody really, when I, thank God, when I worked there, um, they didn't just lean over your shoulder and badger you about everything. They had real security. I mean, the producers I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Real security. So they just give me something and say, do what you think. Do what you feel. Mm -hmm. And uh, I appreciate that because that allowed me to just express myself. And they gained more confidence as years went. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go through a couple more things okay. that from Paul Reiser's work at Motown. Thank you, thank you. Now see, I'll give you a brief history of this one now. When I did this, I was in my uh, 20s. Um, see, now if I, if I had to mind the music I have today, I would have been more aggressive in the arrangement. Mm -hmm. uh, like in the intro in particular, uh, bum, bum, ba, da, dum, bum, right? And then you bum, bum, ba, da, dum, bum, right? I would have went, if I know what I, now, what I, what I, if I knew then what I know now, I would have went, dun, dun, da, 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 dun, dun, ba, 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 right? Drives it in, see, you know, <laughs> right into her vocal, see. Mm -hmm. But you know, we just, uh, we were all experimenting back then pretty much. Mm -hmm. you know, so that, there's no mm -hmm. strings on that recording? No, no. Should have been, but no. <laughs> <laughs> When did you guys, how did you guys decide, like, okay, no strings on this, strings on this? Was it a songwriter um, thing? Was it up to, um, who, who made the call? Well, 90% of the time was the producer. Mm -hmm. um, I can't even remember if I ever suggested, you probably did along the way, but I can't remember. It's usually the producer. Mm -hmm. And the songs dictate certain things anyhow. Mm -hmm. see? But now, today, with what I know musically, I could find spots and ways to put on a lot of songs, strings, mm -hmm. you know. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, I want to play this one because mm -hmm. it's a good example of strings and something you had mentioned once before in a previous conversation that we'll get to. Mm -hmm. well, thank you. Thank you. That's one of my favorite songs right there. And I tell you, um, that's when I started realizing that music should be a conversation between the vocals, between the, the, the strings, between the rhythm, just a conversation, you know, weaving in and out. I really don't, as a rule, listen to lyrics. I, I get my feeling from, uh, from the, uh, uh, where the vocal hits, how the chord structure works and everything. 
I think it's wrong, but I don't. Because <laughs> okay. a lot of arrangers, you know, they, they write according to that, what the lyrics speak, they dictate things. Sometimes it gets a little uh, redundant sometimes, I think, because say, and the, in the, in the wind played, and they said, <laughs> you know, they followed. And sometimes it's good, but I never did it. See, mm-hmm. never did it. I let the, uh, the, the, the track and the vocals dictate the melody itself, not the words so much, you know, and the dynamics of it. You know. Yeah, this is a great example of that. Um, it's the, gr- the group is the Originals. That's the original. And the song is Baby, I'm For Real. Mm-hmm. And that's also a Marvin Gaye composition, correct? Yes, yes. Um, you hear Marvin Gaye in it, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it really does have that, that quality you described, though, of the conversation and the pieces yes. coming in and, and interweaving and going yes. out. Mm-hmm. You also have harp on this. Yes. So tell us One a little bit about the challenges of doing an arrangement for a harp. Well, a lot of, lot of arrangers, they study hard and long, and they, the technique has to be just so-so. I find that if you just do, you know, sometimes I'll mix chord cymbals with glissando, okay. arpeggio, whatever I might need. Uh, I'll I never write out note for note like Glissando. Never. <laughs> okay. Don't know how to. <laughs> okay. Glissando being know, what? Being a. Mean, you know, up and down, you know, Glissando. Yeah. Uh, I, um, I just never studied the harp technique, see, but I hear it and I work with harpists who are, are so good. Gail Levant, Pat Terry Ross, Gail Levant being first call for film and records in, in California. Pat Terry Ross being uh, the the uh, Detroit Opera House uh, uh, prim- prim- primary harpist and and second call for the Detroit Symphony. She's a, by the way somebody I went to high school with. Yeah, mm-hmm. Pat Terry Ross. But uh, they know their instrument so well. Why should I try to teach them? Right. <laughs> so I just write according to my my knowledge, and then they tell me, well, this is how I'm going to do this. They say it to themselves usually. Or they might ask me, well, what did you exactly mean with this? And I say, well, I'm trying to do something, and they'll do it, see? I don't try to, just like violin players, viola players, I don't tell them how to bow. They see the music, I write my phrases, write my accents, and they know the instruments. I let them do it, see? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you said, I think he's told me once, that the, the, the harp, you just indicate a starting point and a finishing point for that? Yes, More that's important. That's important according to, according to the track and according to vocals and according to dynamics, a lot of things, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. the start, finish. Uh, sometimes I'll intertwine actual notes to emphasize a violin part or something. Mm-hmm. I'll do it simultaneous with the violins, which works, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll do it simultaneous with the violas and cellos to give emphasis on attack, yeah. certain parts. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I wonder if we might... Uh, Go down to these mm-hmm. two. Is okay, that, whatever is that you cool? want to do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We're in still we're still in the Mo- Motown mm-hmm. mode right now, um, but so many of these are are classics, and what we're going to do is actually check out two different treatments of the same record or same song rather, mm-hmm. and uh, compare them. Two versions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you see now, in this version, uh, calls for different techniques of, uh, of parts and uh, placement and the whole thing, uh, inst- certain instruments used to certain others. So mm-hmm. I, that's my version now. Somebody else could take it and do another thing with it maybe. Right. But that's my take of it, see. And uh, when we did the rhythm, the rhythm just dictated certain things that should happen on top to me, see. Now you did the strings on this one rhythm also? Too. Rhythm too, And rhythm, okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, okay, that's, that's mm-hmm. even better. So what, um, you know, the thing about these Motown recordings that's um, in addition to the performances and songwriting and musicianship that's always so memorable is some of these details. There's a little rim shot the, I, thing. I was just hearing that in my head. Right? <laughs> uh, we're all listening to yeah. it, right? Yeah, right? It kind of... Do you remember where that came from? Uh, yeah. It precedes the vocals. Right? It kind of sets it up, see. But do you remember uh, where that idea might have come from? Was it something that the one of the drummers had sort of done on their own, or is it just? It was natural. I just felt it. Yeah. You know, it kept the track moving. You know, let it breathe a little bit. You hear it every four bars. You know, 
So this, this one also, the strings mm -hmm. are, are at the beginning, but then it also continues yes. to build. Yes. Yes, well, usually one, you might not hear strings for the first half of a right. verse, maybe. That allows the song to establish itself. That's my principle, okay? Mm -hmm. That's why I don't come in right on the verse, load it up with strings or whatever. Let it, let it develop, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now this other version we're gonna play. Do you want to play the vocal or the instrumental version? Which is your preference? Whatever you, whatever you choose. <laughs> you like them all, don't you? I'll, we know well, this is the wave, so we'll play the we'll play the, the okay. higher quality copy. Um, yeah. So this is the other version of that song, and this you have described as your favorite. Well, yeah, is this your because favorite? what it yeah. did, this introduced Motown into a truly symphonic uh, uh, genre, a whole another area. It set them apart from a lot of R&B companies. This particular. The okay. song, the version. Thank you. Now, now, yeah, like I say, this song here, first of all, created by two of the greatest writers in the business, Ashford and Simpson, Nick Ashford, Valerie Simpson. Nick just passed away recently, as you probably all know. Greatest, one of the greatest writer team, writing teams in the history of songs. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this, this song here, not only did it elevate Motown, but it elevated me, too. I finally was able to, excuse me, Mike. <laughs> I finally was able to open up musically as my training it dictated. And, and uh, boy, this song created a lot of challenges because of dynamics and the different changes here and there, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of challenges. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really uh, totally different from yes. the original version. Yes. And, uh, you know, it's w this word has kind of been overused in recent years, but this yes. is truly an epic sort yes. of arrangement yeah, and production. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the change at the end, there's a key change at the end. Yes. So mm -hmm. was that part of the, uh, Original? you know, how, how Nick and Valerie conceptualized That's the way it? That's they conceptualized it. Valerie Simpson, great piano player, just great. She's, uh, in fact... She was so great, the only way to get the feel out of their material is for her to play. Mm -hmm. Okay, 90% of the time, she was the one who played uh, the acoustic piano, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. That's where the feel comes from. You can feel, just feel the piano in there, see? Right. That's Valerie Simpson, okay? Um, mm -hmm. I guess uh, this is early 70s, correct? Was this, yes. Now, this was done yes. partly in Detroit and partly yes. where? New York City. And I'll tell you why we did that. The rhythm section in New York, um, they're great players, don't get me wrong, great players, but nothing like the Funk Brothers in Detroit. That's why it feels so on the bottom, you know? Funk Brothers, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, but what happened with the top now, meaning the sweetening, the horns and strings, were done in New York for reasons that um, there's a crispness out of their playing and their performance. And the vocals were done in New York. Mm. Those are uh, uh, background vocals, New York singers, Valerie Simpson and Nick Ashford included, okay? Mm -hmm. just, they just get a, a, a fire in their singing like, like no other singer to me, anyhow. Chicago comes pretty close, yeah. but New York is, is premier. See, for, for those kind of singers, you get that fire up top, you know? Mm. What year did... Um what, now this was done, okay, in two different places, two different cities, two yes. different studios. So at that time, early 70s, sort of set the scene as far as what's happening at Motown. Um, yes. Um, after this point, you, you, uh, what happened is Valerie Simpson and Nick Astrid came with such great songs. Stevie Wonder was always great, don't get me wrong, he was always there from, from the beginning. Mm -hmm. But what it brought out in the other producers and writers was more creativity, okay? They saw that the company was open to that as opposed to just hard beats, you know. You really get some music out of it. So, so they started writing different songs, different style songs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess, you know, maybe we should play this because this is your songwriting. Uh, oh, what becomes of Yeah, why don't we play a little bit and then we'll get into a little bit about what was going on with Motown. This is uh, this actually, song? go ahead, I'm sorry, no, introduce no, it. you go ahead. Go ahead. Well, this is a song you also wrote. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. What Becomes of the Broken Hearted? I'll give you the history once, once you hear it. It's, you won't believe it. Yeah. Okay, here we go. Now, 
No. No, I can, I'll tell you how, uh, how this all came about. You know, a lot of arrangers and, and writers, uh, or orchestrators and composers, they just might write down chords because they feel good and they're structured and whatnot. Don't know what to call it, right? It's just some chords. I'm not a keyboard player, but when I use a keyboard, I'm composing. That's the only time I use a keyboard. So, um, so then I had a session to do for Jimmy Ruffin and uh, two producers <coughs> called uh, Weatherspoon and Dean, William Weatherspoon, James Dean. So they had two songs. Uh, I had this one set of chords I always carried around, no name or anything. Uh, so we finished that two songs on Jimmy Ruffin. Uh, th we don't even remember what the songs were because of what, what we couldn't come to the broken heart it became. See, we got all the other songs, right? Uh, but what happened is this. We had a three-hour session, and the, we had an hour left. We did two songs. We had an hour left. This is at the rhythm stage, okay? The, the foundation. So I says, I got some chords I want to try. Do you want to hear them? And they said, well, yeah, bring them out. You know, Motown was just like that, R&D, research and development all the time. It's just an open door policy for that. So they allowed me to get these chords out. And we started working them, working them, working them. And it became the song. See, uh, the structure is just like I wrote it. But then we didn't have title. We had nothing, see. And they say, uh, you know, one of, one of the producers, William Weatherspoon, he stuttered quite a bit. He said, I, 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 I really like that Paul right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so they took the song and put lyrics and melody to it. I did all the music, mm -hmm. all the music I created. They put melody and lyric to it, which are great, great both sides of it. And, um, and uh, Jimmy Ruffin put his vocals on, and it became one of the biggest songs in Motown. Mm -hmm. See? Mm -hmm. That's how the song happened, mm -hmm. literally. Mm -hmm. Now, we've been talking about this process and this craft a little bit, mm -hmm. but um, I know today you wanted to do some demonstration as well and not just talk in the abstract. Yes. Yes. So that's why we took us a little while to get ready today because we're going to try yeah. something. Yeah. So um, uh, we're going to have our, uh, a, a couple of folks here come up. But, um, mm -hmm. Paul, you have a the song we started off this this session with the Stevie Wonder song. Yes, does not have any strings on it. No. Okay. Not S to this day. This All right. Be, you're the first time in history hearing songs hearing strings on this song. All right. Okay. So <laughs> all right. So we're gonna give this a shot. Um, yeah. Basically, we'll play a little bit of the song just to remind everybody what it sounds like. We'll back it up, and um, I'll shake the hand of the concert master. Okay. So yeah. So we have some musicians here. Uh, <laughs> and we'll, we'll just, you guys go ahead and sit down. We're just going to play a little bit of song. And you guys just, mm -hmm. just, just hang out. Don't, don't play anything yet. And uh, just remind everybody what this was like, um, even though we've heard it many times. Yeah. All right. Um, mm -hmm. Now, I guess, Paul, you, you said you wanted to uh, put the string arrangement on this. Mm -hmm. now, now, tell everybody what you did while they were waiting outside. You were in the <laughs> other room. What were you doing? I was writing this arrangement. It took about a half hour. I didn't do the whole song, but it's just to show you how we operated at the Motown uh, factory, I call it, okay? Uh, now, this is their first time seeing this music, by the way, which is the way studio musicians operate, okay? It's not like they have a chance to take the music home one day and bring it back and play it the next day. They have to read it right on the spot. There's a film musicians. You all the film music, music you hear? All the cartoon music, yeah, all that fantastic music, they sight read it, okay? Which I was, I'm amazed all the time at that. They're the best musicians in the world. So what we're gonna do, this is the first rundown, and the way we do things is the first rundown, there are always things we wanna tweak, okay? So I'm gonna stop them and, and tell them how to phrase maybe certain things. Who knows, they might do it right off the bat, I don't know. But we, I, the conductor or the, com or the orchestrator will instruct them as to, well, this is what I meant at this spot, that spot. The bars are numbered, I think, right? All the bars are numbered? Yeah. Bar numbers, I think. Number. Number? Numbered bar? Bars? Okay. So that's for a reason. It saves time. I tell them what bar to go back to. Uh, I can keep it in my head. This is a short version. But usually I'll have a score, okay? A, a master score. Uh, so we can get started. I don't need to conduct them. The music, the beat.
kind of dictates where it goes, okay? All right. I'll cue you at uh, I'll cue you at letter A. The A. Okay? Down B. No, 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 no. I'll cue you at uh, where you come in, your cue bar the third bar of the intro. Third bar. Yeah. Okay? Mm -hmm. So do you want do you want mm -hmm. you want to play the, the track the rhythm and then add add them in? Uh, you or have just the rhythm. Add? You don't have we don't have just rhythm. We don't have the rhythm, rhythm, but we can have we have the vocal. We can just play. That's the fine. Let's, uh, so play it low. Yeah, let's play it a little low. All right. So what we'll do is we'll play the track yeah. and keep it low enough so that these guys can and figure out what they're doing. And they don't need me to conduct. The, normally I would be in, in in just standing up, just keeping a beat and cue in certain spots in the in the track, just for reference. But <laughs> they don't need a conductor usually. The beat right. is so strong. All right, well, let's, let's give it a shot, okay? So, you want to count it off, or are we just going to go in? Just we can go, go in. in. All right. All right, I just wanted to give you an idea of how we do in the studio, okay? All right? And that's where we have, like, a fuller string section. I use, I like to use 17 pieces, and that includes a harp, okay? That's uh, nine violins, four violi, three celli, and the harp. That's what I like. That's what we use way back in the 60s. You see? And I use that combination to this day. So I've never used a string quartet. Never. Because it, it, you just don't get the, the, the thickness or the feel. So <laughs> just not there. But um, these are great players. Let's give them a hand. Yeah. Okay. Let's give them a hand. All right. All right. Thank you. Shake the man. the castle man. Thank you. Thank you. But that's how it's done in the studio. It's, it's never done in the first take, never, because you have the engineers have to get levels and, and uh, mic placements have to be at a certain spot and the harp has to be tuned. And you, you can imagine how many strings on the harp. I, I lost count how many strings on the harp. <laughs> you know, they all have to be in tune, see. So I want to thank you all. You know, okay, you're yeah, free to stay if you like. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you can go relax yeah. and sit down now. Yeah. Yeah. But thanks so much. Thank I, you. This, uh, thank you. And once more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that was just this spontaneous sort of yes. thing that. Uh, That's Paul why just I respect. Brought up. Yeah. Yeah, I respect uh, studio musicians so much because they come in for the first time, literally, first time they have to read stuff that was written like it's written for by Beethoven or, or Mozart. They have to sit and read it, sight read. See. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about, uh, you know, what happened when you guys found out that Motown was was leaving. Was leaving. Yeah. <laughs> really, really sto uh, a strange story. Who in here has seen the movie Standing in the Shadows of Motown? Okay. So uh, that's just the way it happened. I'll give you the story. You know, we're rolling along. You know, it's like a factory at Motown. Okay. It is a little house. Which, is the, which was the studio at the rear. Uh, we were just rolling along, and so they, we had a session the next day, and we come to the studio, the, music, the rhythm players, the Funk Brothers, and they see a sign saying, um, studio closed, uh, no session, it's canceled in other words, the session is canceled, and then we all find out just like that, no previous announcement did Motown move. <laughs> okay, they moved. <laughs> To the out of the city, just shut down. They knew it two weeks in, in advance of that, but none of us really knew it. See, I didn't know it. I was uh, there every day doing something. So uh, that's how that happened. Yeah. And what was the reaction? What happened to some of the musicians and and folks in Detroit who uh, you know depended on this for uh, their their living? Well, we all kind of looked at each other, just like me and Jeff here. What? You know, what What we do now? Because that's all we knew. That's all we knew was Motown for the most part. But of course, after that, it left, uh, it, what, when Motown left, it left a big void for other companies to fill. See, so, mm -hmm. so that opened up places like United Sound Systems, which was a very popular place. The studio United Sound System is where the Funk Parliament Funkadelic recorded. Um, uh, um, Arthur Aretha Franklin recorded over there. Um, just big stars, huge stars recorded there. Mm -hmm. um, so it opened up several independent studios and opened up business for them. So 
things kind of opened up. The Funk Brothers were able to move and play different places because prior to that, the Funk Brothers, which was the house band, Funk Brothers, they were kept from recording at other places. So that opened it up for them too. But we were all in shock at first, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. um, by leaving Detroit and leaving the studio at Motown, the actual physical studio, how did that change the sound of Motown's, Motown's records, yeah? Well, naturally, the, 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 the root of the Motown sound was the Funk Brothers, okay? When they moved to California, they didn't take the Funk Brothers. So that automatically changed the sound, automatically, you know? Uh, great musicians, um, independent of one another, though. They didn't play li together like the Funk Brothers did. Mm -hmm. um, great musicians on the West Coast. Uh, and Motown bought a studio, which didn't have the acoustics of the pit, as we called it. Right. Studio A, the pit. That's what we call the pit, okay? And um, uh, so everything changed on the West Coast. It totally changed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, now, we heard a bunch of the 60s Motown recordings and early 70s Motown recordings. Um, but in your, by your ears and your description, how would you describe the, the sound of that studio, the pit, how, the sound of that room? Hmm. Like, what were the acoustics like, and why did it sound that way? Okay. First of all, Motown had equipment that was hand-built, literally, like the compressors, the, 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 the uh, direct boxes. Uh, all that gear was handmade at the studio. We had genius engineers like Ed Wolfram, mm -hmm. Mike McLean, uh, Russ Tarana. These were genius engineers, you know. They actually built equipment that, pion was, that just pioneered into the marketplace. First at Motown, then it spread out through the, through the rest of the industry, mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. literally. Mm -hmm. But you, um, you, know, you were able to maintain quite a bit of steady work, even after, yes. why, what do you attribute that to? My Motown foundation, my classic, uh, classical foundation primarily, and then the Motown college, I call it, <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. which really taught me about uh, how to, how to, how my part, play, what, how important my part was to make things right, because I was usually the end result of a piece of product, see, right. uh, uh, musically anyhow. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's like putting icing on a cake. That's why they call it sweetening, icing on the cake, see, yeah. Uh, I'd like to play just a couple more things post Motown of your work. Um, whoa, hold on a second. Because, um, I don't want everybody to get the incorrect impression that that Paul actually, his career stopped at Motown by any means mm -hmm. at all. So here's something that was post-Motown from somebody who I hope you all recognize. Thank you. Now, uh, first of all, I want to pay tribute to uh, Luther Vandross, okay, whom we lost. Everybody knows Luther. Great musician, great visionary musically. Um, uh, this particular song, which was uh, probably the first one we did in this collection, mm -hmm. never too much. Um, just to show you what I know, I didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> I did not like it. I didn't think it was a hit. <laughs> And the rest is history, right? <laughs> <laughs> Little I know. That's why I don't pick the hits. I don't pick them well. Uh, and, and, and another thing, had I another, had another chance at this, which I'm going to do. See, I'm going to do what my favorite songs were over the years in a CD for myself and do them instr instrumentally with some background vocals. See, I want to do it different. I hear a million and one things that I should have done, I feel, anyhow. But, uh, you know, we have to let, let good dogs live, mm -hmm. you know? The strings on this so. particular song, though, are, I mean, I, you say you didn't like this one, but I, I'd hope you take some pride in your work on this recording, because, I mean, the strings <laughs> are like the thing that really I put it do. over the top. You know? <laughs> At this point, I do. Okay. Absolutely. Um, yeah. But there's a lot yeah. going on. Do you, do you recall anything as far as how, what came, what was in your mind as far well, as? Well, I knew I didn't want to, there was a lot going on rhythmically. Yeah. I, I just made it a point not to get in the way, see. 
and made uh, whatever I did fit and, uh, and pick it like a conversation, like I said, you know, it's, uh, mm -hmm. create different moods in different spots. And right. Then let it breathe. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm going to play this because this is something. This is an instrumental that did not originally start as an instrumental, but I just think it's worth everybody sort of realizing this is also your work if they are familiar with it. Surprise, surprise. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's been a while since I heard this, and boy, it brings, us, it brings back a lot of memories. I don't know if you noticed, but particularly the rhythm players in here, uh, you notice the difference in Detroit sound? And the New York, that's New York. And uh, Never Too Much is New York, that whole album. And you do hear a distinct difference. Mm -hmm. It's cleaner, it's more uh, precise. Not a lot of feeling, but it has feeling. It has its own <laughs> way of feeling, you know? It's a different Not type a lot of, of looseness, yeah. you know? Yeah. Uh, everything's pretty much structured, you know? Mm -hmm. That's just the New York style, see? Mm -hmm. um, this is another one of Valerie Simpson's creations, okay? Started off as a vocal. And uh, the music just carries itself. Plus, I meant to say this too: the, a track should should have a life of its own. It should be able to stand on its own. See, without the vocal, cut the vocal out, and it should be able to stand. Should be recognizable. Uh, this one is very recognizable. You know, um, Valerie Simpson is playing the piano again. You hear the feel in the piano. That's her, and um, she. In her playing, dictated certain things that I did. You see, but she's a very accomplished keyboardist. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, she plays things that she. Certain things you hear in the track, you know that the composer meant it. See, so you work around it. You don't fight it. See, mm -hmm. if it occurs several times in the track, they meant that. See, you know, <laughs> so you don't fight it. You don't destroy it. See? What uh, how how do you describe the uh? You know, I guess a lot of people in this room maybe just make music themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, there is no difference between a producer and a ranger. They're the same person. So I guess in your mind, if, you know, what it is that is relationship? What was though. that relationship like for you in terms of you okay. know, collaborating with a producer and knowing where well, to respect that person and complement what their wish is and, yes, and whatnot? Yes. Well, first of all, I want to create some uh, definition in, in, uh, in, in uh, 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 terms, okay? Arrangers and orchestrators. Who knows the difference in here between arranger and orchestrator? Can anybody tell me offhand? No? The, okay, you're close. Close. An arranger, anybody in this room can be an arranger. The, 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 the cameramen can be arrangers. If they hear something, they change something, that's arranging. But of course, uh, an, a, an arranger is not always an orchestrator, but an orchestrator is always an arranger. An orchestrator is the one who, like the young lady says there, puts the notes to the paper, okay, and brings it, actually brings it to life. When you take John Williams and all these great composers, um, uh, all these Broadway composers compose all these great songs. It's not that they're so great as writers. The orchestrator is what brought those songs to life. See? All right? The keyboard, the, the writer maybe had some arrangement ideas, but the orchestrator is always one who brings it to life for the musicians. Okay? Uh, rangers uh, have great ideas. Somebody could walk in here. We could be in the middle of a, of a, a, a really professional and, 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 and great piece of music, and somebody could walk in totally unaware of what's going on and say, oh boy, I hear something. And it could be something that's really, really unique to the song mm -hmm. and help it. Mm -hmm. But that's the difference between orchestrating and arrangers. Now, to get to your point uh, about producers um, and uh, how they uh, affect what I do, is that primarily your question? Sure. Okay. Uh, sometimes they come with an idea, if they come with an idea they've lived with for months, what right do I have, outside of it being ridic a ridiculous idea, what right do I have to say no to it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and usually it's placed in, in a spot where they want something. They've heard this thing over and over in their mind, 
as a producer. And so they say, well, I want this at that spot. Norman Whitfield was good for that. Norman Whitfield, great uh, producer at Motown. Great arranger, because he heard things. And he placed them a lot of times, especially with his rhythm tracks. He might have 10 or 15 guitar tracks on, along his big board back then, n not computerized. We had to remember how to take in and put in and push up and everything. He would know exactly every spot where he wanted each one of those guitars to do, see? So he's a great arranger. Mm -hmm. see? Mm -hmm. And um, now when they come to me, it's uh, rarely that they have specific points. Okay. Like with Stevie Wonder and uh, Rocket Love, okay? He said he wanted uh, specific, you know, the, the, um, the, the line, who, know, who knows Rocket Love in here? By Stevie. Rocket Love, the song? Can I play some of that? Yeah, please, if you have it. Which, which part? Uh, um, uh, from the beginning, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, let me explain this. He, he dictated, because he lived with it, he dictated, bum, 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 bum. Then he left it open. That's all he wanted. Mm. Then he came to the modulation. He says, uh, now this was probably two or three months ahead of us doing it. And I'm surprised I remembered it too. That line, right? It goes, uh, the weird line on top, the string line carries it into the modulation. It's something about that line, I retained it. That's what he wanted in that spot, see? And if I hadn't have done it, he would have fired me. See? <laughs> but yeah. Thank you. That's one of my favorite songs of Stevie's. And uh, like I said, you know, those two spots I indicated is where he definitely wanted. Bum, bum, right? And then. Da, 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 the violin line, those two spots, he left everything up else pretty much up to me. So he wanted a classical approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's how we did it. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I want to play one more thing from Paul before we take some questions for him. Um, this is another artist that you worked with on a couple very famous songs. <laughs> See if you guys don't recognize. No, no, no. See, you got to understand. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Now, I, I, I have to say, R. Kelly is one of the most creative people, R&B-wise, and on the planet, you know? Uh, great idea, man. He can also write the good songs, lyrically and melodically. So he's on the level of a Michael Jackson to me, uh, creative genius, uh, Stevie. He's right up in there, Prince. Um, you name it, uh, the, it's just top R&B people. He is right up there. You name five, he's right up in the top three of four to five, you know? Um, now on this track here, you notice, what's it called? Stepping. Does it ever quit stepping? No. <laughs> right? It never lets up, see? And that's the quality of a good song, see? Mm -hmm. And um, he uh, produces such good, great tracks. Um, uh, all I had to do was pick from there certain things, not get in the way. That's why I tried to stay behind, keep it in. But yet it's felt, you can feel the tension. See, yeah. tension is doesn't necessarily have to be loud. See? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, what's R. Kelly really like, though, Paul? Woo. What's he like? Well, I tell you a strange story. <laughs> he and I met, well, prior to. Um, Prior to us uh, kind of breaking off relationship, which uh, happens in the business, 15 years without even meeting him, yet I did all of his product, see? He would send me, well, when two tracks, the, the two track tapes were on the market, he'd send me two tracks in Detroit from Chicago. We'd get them in FedEx, put the symphony on, the strings, the horns, or whatever we had to do, ship it back next night, okay? We didn't meet for 15 years, okay? Never face to face. Produ he was a producer, I'm the arranger. Mm -hmm. So that took a lot of faith, a lot of faith. And uh, I think R. Kelly is, he's, he's so creative himself, he wants to get the full creativity, creativity out of whoever he works with. Stevie's the same way, Stevie Wonder, same way. He doesn't stand over you and dictate. He just hires you because he wants your abilities, you know? 
That's why people should hire you, because mm -hmm. they want your in, in, in unique talents, see? And uh, not a lot of people are aware of that, see? That's because they're, they're somewhat insecure in what they're doing. When the when person is secure, a producer, they will do it that way. Quincy Jones is probably the tops at that, okay? It's from the people I know, okay? Quincy Jones, he is a master at production, which it means you put the right people in the right places at the right time. He's a master, see? Mm -hmm. yeah. And give R. Kelly credit for being familiar enough with your work to want to have you come yes. in and do yes. your part. Does, yes. any, does anybody have any questions for uh, Paul Reiser at this point? We yes. Actually, hold on just a minute. Just <laughs> let's, let's give you the let's give you the mic so you can um, so you can ask a question. Is that on? Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead. Check, check. So again, in your long career, do you have a track you've worked on that you would never ever like to listen to again, and why? Uh, well, the things that hit the market, I can say no. There are a lot of things that aren't popular in the marketplace, yes. <laughs> Absolutely yes. Um, there are things that I like more or less in the marketplace that were released. Uh, I like some more than others. Every one of my things, I'd love to get back and do it a second time. <laughs> Of course, that's not possible, but, uh, uh, oh, I hear, I just hear constantly, you know. And, and I have a, thank God I haven't had a knack to repeat myself because I got a bad memory. See, with a bad memory, you know, it's hard to repeat yourself, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, I, that's a true story, though. You know, without, uh, if I had a great memory, great memory for the music I write, I would live with that music forever. I would, uh, maybe appreciate my music more than I should. So I just do it and I move on to the next thing. It's almost like uh, I block out everything so, and move on to something fresh. Yeah. And then uh, I pray that it gets into the marketplace and makes a little noise, see? That's what keeps us going. It's word of mouth, it's what people hear and what they talk about, see? Who else has a question? Wait for the mic. Uh, I actually have like t two questions. One's a little one, so I'll just get that out of the way. Who was like the toughest person that you dealt with work-wise? I mean, from an <laughs> act, from a singer. I mean, maybe not like a session musician, but maybe someone that we'd be more familiar with that was a real pain in the ass. I would say Lauren Hill. <laughs> okay, Lauren Hill. I'll tell you why. <laughs> great talent, great talent. Um, but uh, I would say insecure in a way, in a lot of ways, um, because she had so much talent. She was she could never really settle on anything, so that I could move forward easily. Total disaster. Two 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 times. Once up in New York, she hired me to to, to come in and do some things. Um, in fact, we worked out of New Jersey at that time. She had a home over there. That's where she's from, New Jersey. Um, disaster, okay, with the company and her, but the company, Sony Entertainment, still believed in her, so they kept her on board. They were trying to recoup their investment, too, <laughs> okay? So then there was another time, 10 years later, okay, in Miami. Another bigger disaster, okay? <laughs> because uh, she was insecure, didn't have material prepared, uh, had been through maybe, uh, I don't know how many musicians, because she had a tendency to call musicians from all over the country, top musicians. And just because they're top musicians don't mean they can work together. And that was part of the problem, mm -hmm. see. Um, then she, she never was ready for me, so I went down, wasted a good week and a half, and uh, a lot of money wasted, just money wasted, you know? Um, and just, I know, I mean, what, 
what was did you have much involvement and excuse my ignorance from oh, not I hear being, you for not being like yeah. familiar you've already you yeah. know blown my mind so far with some of the stuff that you've okay. obviously done that I'm familiar with um but through the disco era did you play a role in any of you know significant productions and stuff considering strings play a huge role in, I in did some yeah, not as much as yeah the Ashford and Simpson in particular they they wrote good songs during that era I was uh, I'm very glad to, to be a part of. Um, outside of that, I did some things for uh, Gloria Gaynor. Um, not, not a lot. But uh, good R&B was still happening underneath that, you know. It was steady. But the disco was what it was, yeah. Just like rap is what it is today, you know. And we'll get to a discussion about that. <laughs> But yeah, yeah, but yes, to your, to your of course, the answer to your question, um, I did okay, okay? I didn't seek it out uh, because I thought it was gonna be the major change for music. I didn't seek it out and uh, did okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, the Ashford and Simpson records you worked on are for club classics, maybe mm -hmm. on a more underground level. Yes. But that, mm -hmm. that song we heard earlier is a bougie bougie. It's a yes. big Larry Levan mm -hmm. record, mm -hmm. Paradise Garage. Mm -hmm. And um, but who are some of the other folks you worked with uh, through the seventies though in the pop and rock realm? Well, I worked with uh, Bill Withers, um, uh, Quincy Jones. Almost partnered with Quincy Jones prior to Thriller, but Stevie and I have been talking, and naturally I knew Stevie like from child time we were kids, right? And so uh, it's like taking a fork on the road, right? You can't go both ways, right? So I chose to go with Stevie, because Stevie wanted me to be involved with his record company, his production. And um, if I had been growing a beard before I got with Stevie, I mean, until he called me, my beard would be around this room, okay? <laughs> we still work together, but I haven't been directly involved with his production companies as, as we talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, he means well, you know, and everything, but Stevie, Stevie, he's a one-man show, pretty much. And Quincy, I, uh, he asked me, he says, when he left A&M Records, he says, Paul, let's go find us some artists and, and make some music. Because, see, he was primarily jazz at that time, jazz and big band, mm -hmm. Quincy Jones. And so he wanted to, me to direct him into what R&B was about, see? So I chose to go with Stevie. And what was the next record, big records he had? Well, I did work for with the Brothers Johnson mm -hmm. and the Jacksons back then when, Steve, when Quincy was doing them. But what was the big record for Michael Jackson? Thriller. And I was going the other way when I should have went that way. <laughs> but it's all good. It's all for a reason, you know? I don't have any regrets, no. Who else has a question for uh, for Paul? So me again. You said <laughs> rap music, and my question is, what's your attitude towards sampling? So you obviously have well, a lot of records that have been sampled. Okay, as long as they get the credits where credits are due, no problem. That's what the big fight is about, and it's finally finally starting to to move where it should be. Uh, James Brown was the first one to really really get his propers. From from sampling, see the very first one, but it's it's catching on, still not good enough, but it's catching on. <laughs> <laughs> and plus, I think if the if the rappers would just dig deep into their uh, storehouse of creativity, they'd come up with their own things. Mm -hmm. See, but they uh, thank God they they are in love with what happened. See, so old school meets new school, and <laughs> it's coming together. Yeah. Some other folks here had some questions too. Let's make sure everybody gets a chance. May I ask a question? Uh, what do you think uh, in the work of a producer? What percent of, I don't know, talent, uh, genius, God's will, and uh, hard work is really important? Well, producers like uh, writers, like arrangers, like uh, human beings, they're like fingerprints, okay? No two are alike, they don't think alike. They don't perform alike in the marketplace. Um, they're similar because there's certain standards that set production away from other areas, writers, and there are certain standards. 
The producer is in charge of everything product-wise, everything. That's the producer's uh, job. A lot of producers don't realize that. They try to meddle in the writer's area. They try to meddle in the, in the, uh, uh, in the uh, rangers area, the musicians, and they don't have the talent a lot of times. A lot of them do, but a lot of them don't, okay, and they create a mess. And who's, who do they blame afterwards? Well, the, I tried to get this out of the musicians and they couldn't play and blah, 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 you know, it's easy to pass the buck, see? But the producer is in charge, he's, he's responsible. The buck stops with the producer. Like with the president of a company CEO, the buck stops with him regardless of what they did under him, right? It stops at the top. Producer, is that responsible? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Who's next? And, and it is a, it's an area that is, is, a, is, is really one that um, uh, a lot of people don't know. It should be a school for production. It really should be. I don't know, a certain amount of classes. You get a certificate, you can produce. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, how do you feel about the current state of R&B, like in 2011, you know? Well, I think it's lacking a lot because good R&B people have, have uh, sold out in a lot of respects to hip hop and rap and Okay, not to say that hip hop and rap doesn't have its place. It has its place because uh, there's a lot of revenue genera generated and a lot of interest worldwide, so we gotta give it credit, see? But a lot of them have, have gone from what they know to be the, their natural talents into an area that, where they wanna make money. They do it to make money in most cases. So uh, then the, 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 uh, the media, radio stations, TV, uh, MTV, all they say, the, the Grammys, I think they've deteriorated and, and kind of dumbed down to where certain things are, see. They don't stress R&B as they had in the past, see, which was, it was great during those years, see, mm -hmm. great. But now it's, uh, it's leaning towards popularity, so pretty much, see. I don't agree. Mm. I don't agree. You, uh, mm -hmm. You spoke highly of R. Kelly. Anyone else yes. that's still like, um, you know, currently really active? That yeah. You really appreciate? Um, yes. Um, in the uh, in the area of um, of uh, um, rap and and, and uh, I guess you could say Jay Z. I respect. Okay. He's uh, he knows the the, the business of music. He knows why things are. And he speaks to that level. I respect him thoroughly. Mm -hmm. um, I respect uh, Eminem. Okay? And he's also thoroughly respected by his peers, which is, uh, which is hard. Believe me, that's a tough area to be accepted in. Especially if you're a white artist, it is tough. Okay? He was accepted like that. It was a little difficult getting in. But once he was in, uh, the right ones accepted him as being true to the heart, and the rest is history, you know? So I respect, yeah, respect him thoroughly. There are others, of course, you know. But those are, I think, the ones that primarily come to mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in terms of, mm -hmm. you know, songwriting and R&B mm -hmm. and what you discussed just now, I mean, you know, you'd said before, you mentioned Cass Technical High School. Yes. I mean, it's an entirely different era of uh, education in America where yes. uh, you were required to study all of these different things. Yes. Cass, uh, the school was called Cass Tech, is called Cass Technical High School. And boy, do we ever stress technical, okay? Uh, you, first of all, you had to uh, average uh, C plus B. Uh, B minus to get in, your grade point average, you know. Um, you, you couldn't just walk in and, and sign up and go in. You had to be recommended like a uh, year or two in advance for Cass Tech High School. It was a building, uh, the, the, the previous building, which is torn down now. Just recently, about a month ago, it was torn down. Mm -hmm. Seven stories high. 
uh, a whole block wide, okay? And uh, they turned out uh, some of the best people in the industry, science, um, music, okay? A lot of their people have ended up uh, as, as principal players with symphony orchestras, mm -hmm. okay? Um, jazz players, um, uh, what's his name, bass, bass player uh, Ron Carter, uh, Gerald Wilson out of Cast Tech. Um, I came from Cast Tech, of course, uh, thank goodness. Donald Byrd. Donald Byrd, yes, yes. Just, they just turned them out because they stressed classical music first. They stressed the classics, foundations, and, which is lacking nowadays in a lot of cases. Yeah. Who else has a question for Paul? Mm -hmm. I have a quick question. Is there anybody you haven't worked with yet that you still want to work with? Yes. Um, I wanted to work with Michael in his later years. I didn't get a chance to. Came very close, but I worked with him when he was much younger. Okay. At Motown, At Motown yeah. Okay, mm. thank you. Primarily Michael, yeah. Uh, let's see. I would like to work with... Um, Major symphony orchestras, okay? London Philharmonic, the, the Munich uh, uh, Philharmonic, the um, Berlin Philharmonic, the, uh, um, the uh, uh, you just name them, you know, Boston, Boston Philharmonic, uh, mm -hmm. Philadelphia, the Philadelphia Philharmonic, um, you name it, LA uh, Philharmonic, you know? But I'm working towards that, see? There's a name I want to bring up to you guys, and you want to maybe want to Google this guy's name. He's Kevin Koska is his name. One of the finest orchestrators, composers that I met. He was 21 out of the school of Berkeley School of Music, 21 years old. Graduated with uh, honors in film uh, scoring. John Williams immediately picked him up. What an honor, you know, John Williams taking a guy right out of school. So he orchestrated quite a few things for John Williams in the beginning. Uh, and he is um, looking to brand his name. So I want you to look for that name, Kevin Koska. I'm pushing him. <laughs> I'm pushing him. Because mm -hmm. he's 37 now. And I uh, asked him point blank, well, what happened to your brand by this time? Because his music is that good. OK? Great writer and uh, orchestrator. Uh, so he says, uh, his answer was simple. He says, I don't know. <laughs> so I kind of answered it for him. I says, well, given these uh, top, right, top rank uh, composers and whatnot, John Williams and the like, uh, uh, Lalo Schifrin, uh, um, you name it, just a whole slew of the ones. It's only a handful, but they're always used for, for great films. They are afraid of him, and, and a lot of times, uh, a major talents are afraid of upcoming people that have talent. Yeah, I think some of you maybe have run into that <laughs> on occasion, see. But they're really afraid, and there's nothing to be afraid of. Everybody's different. Everybody's like fingerprint. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody in this room can do like I do. Nobody, I can't do like anybody in this room. If we get the same arrangement to do, say the arrangers are in here, Say so you did 10 arrangers, the same exact piece of music to arrange, it's gonna come out 10 different ways, literally, okay? Even though we're using the same 12 notes, 10 different ways, that's how unique everybody is, see? But people don't realize that, so, yeah. All right, one last question, mm -hmm. and we're gonna break, so. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Hold, wait for mm -hmm. the microphone, please. Yeah. with R&B, so what are the other styles of music and uh, especially electronic music that is coming up now uh, that Good you would question. want to, yeah? <laughs> well, as you know, there are a lot of, uh, so there's a lot of software related to arranging and orchestration and music prep, right? Now, this is just me speaking now. Don't, don't put me in the ground for this. I hate it. <laughs> I never use it. I hate it. I like the feel of pencil to paper music. It's a dying art. Uh, it's, now, don't get me wrong now. It's, it has its place in, in the marketplace. But I don't like it. Never used it. I had people come to me and say, boy, I got this new producers. 
I got this new software, man. You got to hear these stream samples. You got to hear this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and I listened. And now, they, mind you, they paid $1,500, $2,000 for this software. And I said, after about a few bars, I said, no. You know why? <laughs> and I said, without any, any, any uh, uh, trepidation, I said, because um, you can never, I'm stressing, never get the feel from electronics that you do from real players in the room. Like these players here, no two players play alike. That's, where, that's how a symphony orchestra gets its ambience and sound. No two are alike, even though they're all synchronized, seemingly playing the same. They don't vibrato the same. They don't, they, their tonality is not the same. The pitch is not perfect until you get the big sound. So you can, you can, you can continue to track and track and track one, one track after another of strings. If you don't detune up or down a hair, it's going to sound the same thing. I don't care if you got 100 of those tracks, it will always sound the same. But if you use real players, you got all these wrong playing people in the mix of it. When I say wrong, I mean they're not perfect in other words, right? Great players. And that's why it sounds the way it sounds, see? Yeah. You never get to that with electronic music. No. <laughs> N O no. I respect it, but no. 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 I do thoroughly respect it, you know. Okay. But I'm a, I'm a purist. That's the problem. <laughs> okay. And I cannot be swayed one way or the other. I'm like ha a horse with halters. Well, I have a feeling some of the people in this room will try to persuade you over dinner, so, uh, you know. We'll try. <laughs> you guys can break bread and see if you can come to some sort of uh, Thank you. peace. But um, we're going to break now, so let's all say thanks once again to uh, Mr. Paul Reiser. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.